Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Flory. I'm the Northern Indiana organizer for Solar United Neighbors. And I just would like to begin with a hearty welcome to everyone who uh, has uh, registered and has joined in with this uh, webinar, uh, our Indiana Solar 101. Uh, if you uh, have come here to learn more about solar, uh, to learn more about uh, the state of solar in Indiana, as well as uh, our new Ready, Set, Solar program, you are in the right place. Uh, welcome. It's good to have you with us. And we're going to go ahead and uh, get started on the webinar. So just a few logistical details before uh, we get into the content. First of all, we welcome questions. Uh, there's a couple of ways that you can engage. And my uh, colleague Fatima uh, from Sun is uh, going to monitor both the Q&A as well as the uh, chat. You'll notice at the bottom of your screen, I think most people it's the bottom, will either be the bottom or the top, uh, there's a menu bar for Zoom that includes information uh, about a variety of things. But one of those that I wanna highlight is uh, the chat feature uh, that you can type um, in, and interact with other guests uh, in the chat as well as the Q&A. And that's a, a place where um, both of those where Fatima will be monitoring any questions or comments that you make will be engaging with you some questions. Uh, uh, she will be uh, answering in the chat or in the Q&A and other questions uh, we'll save until the very end, we will have a Q&A time uh, at the end of the webinar here. Also, once the webinar is finished, uh, you'll receive an email with uh, the materials uh, and the, a recording. So there'll be some follow-up after uh, the webinar is finished. So who are we? What is Solar United Neighbors? Uh, some of you joining us may be uh, aware of who we are and have interacted with us before. Others of you, this might be one of the first times that you've uh, learned about us. Uh, so Solar United Neighbors, we are a, a national uh, nonprofit. Uh, we are not solar stall installers. We're not uh, affiliated with uh, any company or any product. Uh, we're vendor neutral. And that gives us the ability to uh, offer unbiased advice. Uh, we re re rely entirely on community engagement and involvement to affect change. And we got our start in 2007 uh, in Washington, D.C. I often like to say that we're one of the few Washington, D.C. based nonprofits that actually was started by people who lived in Washington, D.C. before the nonprofit uh, came into being. Uh, our founder's son asked how their family could go solar. They recruited neighbors and uh, essentially put together a 50-family solar co-op to make solar more affordable in their neighborhood. Uh, with their success, more people were interested, more neighborhoods, uh, and eventually uh, other states and uh, other areas uh, connected in. And right now we have staff in 12 states, as well as Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico. Uh, we also have a national team that can uh, connect with people all across the country, uh, as well as our state-based teams that I mentioned. Our three-part theory of change for Solar United Neighbors is that we help people to go solar, join together, and fight for their energy rights. And that that's a cyclical pattern, that one impacts the next and then comes back and impacts uh, the beginning. And we're a community of people dedicated to building a new and ener equitable energy system with rooftop solar at the cornerstone. One aspect of solar power that is not often talked about is its ability to allow everyone to participate in the new energy system if they're given a fair opportunity. That's what we mean by working for uh, equity. Uh, and that's the definition of energy equity. It's a core of our fighting for energy rights. Uh, before uh, we get further into the presentation, I think it's important for us to address the inequities in our current ener energy model. And that's just uh, partially to name that Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color bear an unfair share of the cost of energy production but also receive fewer benefits. Uh, families of color are disproportionately harmed by higher utility bills and shutoffs. And on top of that, housing discrimination area to home ownership and thus also to solar ownership. 
when we started as an organization with a group of economically and racially diverse neighbors. Uh, uh, our first solar co-op focused on solar because it helped people to pay their electric bills. And it also helped to, them to stay in their homes at a time when Washington, D.C. was being quickly gentrified and the whole country was in the middle of a financial crisis back in 2008. Rooftop solar lets communities invest locally, it creates good local jobs, and it brings control of our energy system within our reach. We're working towards a new energy system that everyone can participate in, one that is fair and equitable. So the next couple of slides talk a little bit about our overall impact as well as our statewide impact. And you can see the numbers there, uh, they speak for themselves. We've helped over 9,000 families go solar across this country, which is pretty amazing. That's a pretty fantastic number. That represents over 77 megawatts of solar. Now, often when we talk about uh, the size of an array, we talk about kilowatts and a megawatt is 1,000 kilowatts. So uh, 77 is pretty substantial and that represents one 1 million plus metric tons of carbon offset. So that's pretty amazing. Our local team here in Indiana has shown an impact just in the last five years. Uh, the national impact has been uh, for about uh, 16 years, but just in the last five years, since 2019, that was when our Indiana team started here, uh, we've seen 285 new solar homes, uh, that represents two and a half megawatts of installed capacity. That's seven million dollars invested in local solar. That's eleven and a half million dollars of savings over twenty five years, and that's fifty four thousand plus metric tons of lifetime carbon offset. And you are participating in this last number tonight. Uh, that's over five thousand people just here in Indiana who have been educated about solar. So why go solar? There's a whole number of reasons, uh, and here are several of them. Uh, you, there may be others that apply to you as well, and there's the reason why you're here tonight. Uh, bill savings, energy independence, uh, resilience, uh, equity, environmental benefit, uh, these are all valid. And sometimes there's not just one, sometimes there's multiple and they kind of link together. And so uh, keep these in mind when we discuss some of the financial challenges of installing solar in Indiana later on in the webinar. I like this slide because it's just a good reminder of how local solar has an outsized impact in our community. Uh, there's a number of benefits of uh, local solar and what you can do in uh, installing solar on your home or your small business uh, that uh, has an outsized effect uh, impacting uh, the place that you live. Uh, where wherever that may be in Indiana. Uh, some of those benefits are uh, protecting solar owners from rising energy costs, while also lowering, lowering overall costs for everyone. So it not only helps you, but it also uh, helps uh, your uh, neighbors uh, to have lower costs as well. Uh, having local solar reduces the need for expensive centralized generation and grid upgrades. Just a quick word about that. Most of our electricity is still produced in areas that are several hundred miles away from where we're using it, depending on where you live and what your utility is. And the nice thing about local solar, if it's on your own house, you get to use it first. And then your neighbors uh, get to use any excess that you send onto the grid. And so you can't get any more local than that. Whereas with our current centralized system, you have uh, energy plants that are in a variety of places that send the electricity over uh, often hundreds of miles and having to go through multiple substations on multiple uh, high voltage lines. And, and there is um, degradation that happens. And so uh, in the process of that, so it allows for the electricity to be used much more closely to the place that it was generated. Local solar makes the energy system more secure, resilient, and reliable for a lot of the reasons I just named. It reduces air, water, and climate pollution. Uh, solar doesn't, uh, when it's running, it doesn't uh, produce any pollution at all. And this is important. It grows the local economy with good paying jobs and local investments. I just want to say a quick thank you to our statewide partners uh, that work with us uh, on our Solar 101s. I've helped to do promotion for this Solar 101 tonight. 
Uh, so hopefully some of those uh, different uh, organizations have people who are here in this webinar. And uh, hopefully you, uh, if you didn't hear about this webinar from us, you heard it from one of our partners. And uh, so I just wanted to say uh, a hearty thank you. Uh, we couldn't, we don't do this work alone. We do it in partnership with so many great organizations uh, here in Indiana. So what are we going to cover tonight? We've talked about a good uh, a good bit about solar thus far. Uh, we're going to uh, cover a lot more detail. We're going to talk about solar technology. We're going to talk about Indiana solar economics, and then we're going to introduce our Indiana Ready Set Solar program. So we're starting with solar technology. I love this map. This is a map that's provided by NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And it shows a comparison of the solar intensity with red being the most intense sunlight and then uh, going to orange and yellow, green, and then uh, blue and purple. And uh, with the blue and purple being the least intense, Germany is one of the world's leaders in solar. Uh, there was a point uh, in the middle of the summer of last year where 68% of Germany's electricity on one particular day in July was, uh, was produced by uh, solar energy just on that uh, uh, one day alone. As, and that was the peak. There were other days where it was probably up in that uh, 60s range. And so uh, Germany is at a uh, north enough points on the globe that it gets much less solar intensity, much less solar resource than what we do here in Indiana. Most of us are either in the yellow and the green. And so if they can do it in Germany, we can do it here in Indiana. So tonight, what are we talking about? We're talking about solar photovoltaic uh, uh, type of technology. We're not talking about solar water heater. We're not talking about solar fans or solar thermal. We're talking about solar photovoltaic technology, PV technology that converts solar energy into electricity. The majority of today's solar market is PV technology, and it's what you see with solar farms or on rooftops or ground mounts for business or personal use. So I love this slide because it just gives you a, a snapshot in one place of how solar works. So obviously, one of the most important parts of solar is the sun. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, many of us enjoyed the bright sunny day today after having some uh, rain yesterday. And the sun, for those of us who have solar, was shining down today, producing a lot of electricity uh, on our solar panels. Uh, the, the, electric, the energy that's produced by the panels is DC, or direct current energy. So that's in number one, where you can see the, the sun shining on the panels. Uh, the panels create the energy that then sent to number two, which is an inverter. And we'll be talking about all of these in more detail here in a minute. But the inverter is important because it counts the amount of energy produced and it converts the energy from DC to AC. AC is the type of electricity that's used in your home or school or office. And so then at that point, the inverter sends the electricity to your electrical panel in your house. Uh, and so when we talk about having the panels, having the, the panels produce the electricity and you getting to use it first, that's where the chart really uh, just drives that point home. The panels produce the energy, the, the sense to the uh, inverter, the inverter then converts it to AC, sends it right to your panel, and then you can use it in your house. Any excess then goes on to the utility electric meter, assuming that you are connected to the grid. There is one other thing that we'll be talking about here a little, in a little bit, and that's battery storage. If you have a battery or are interested in batteries, the battery would go in between your electric panel and the utility uh, electric meter. And then after that, it's sent from the utility electric meter onto the grid. So let's go into a little bit more detail about the specific parts of the solar uh, array process. So the first part is the panel. And you can see here the, the basic components of the panel. It's a fairly simple uh, uh, entity by uh, looking at the diagram there. And part of it is that solar is much more affordable because the component parts have decreased and the amount of power produced by each solar cell have increased. So for example, about 10 years ago, uh, the, the standard panel on the market was producing anywhere between uh, 250 and uh, 275 or 80 watts per panel. Uh, today, the uh, 
that has changed and, and has increased pretty dramatically. Probably the standard is uh, anywhere between 400 and 450 watts per panel. Uh, or, and many of them are in the 425 to 450 watt range. And so what that means is that you can have more panels uh, that take up a smaller amount of space on your rooftop and still have the same size of system that somebody 10 years ago would have had with a lot more panels. So if you're talking about uh, the uh, specific part of the technology, the each individual panel or module, as you can see there, uh, when put together with other panels, forms a solar array. Uh, and um, there's multiple types of solar panels. There is polycrystalline uh, as well as monocrystalline. Mono are black in color, which may be aesthetically pleasing but and are more efficient, but they also cost more uh, over a polycrystalline. Here's some important uh, tech terminology as we're understanding about how solar works. And so you heard me talk a little bit ago about comparing kilowatts to megawatts uh, and watts to kilowatts to megawatts. So each, each is increasing by uh, 1000 increments. So the system power that for your array, whether you, you have one or not, would be measured in kilowatts. Uh, so if for a standard home, a lot of times we're talking about probably about a five or six uh, kilowatt uh, system. Uh, depending on the size, you might even get up to 10. But uh, the, the size, uh, the, the system power is measured in kilowatts. The electricity production is measured in uh, kilowatt hours. And kilowatt hours are also the amount that you purchase from the utility or your REMC or your, your Muni, wherever you get your electricity or connected onto the grid. So then we're talking about, when we talk about the average size, I really like this uh, graphic too, because it shows uh, the average size of about a six foot male there. And uh, a six foot male is about the same size as one solar panel, which usually is about three feet wide by five or six feet tall. Now, commercial panels will be larger than that, but the ones that go in your home would be roughly about uh, three by five or six. So it gives you a sense of how large one individual panel is. So you have the panels. We've talked about that, and we've talked about the amount of power. You might wonder, how do the panels stick to the roof for uh, those who have, have uh, rooftop solar? Uh, they don't just, uh, they, they, you don't set, just set them up there on the roof. You have to attach them to something. There's a whole lot of reasons for that, and a lot of it's common sense. And so that's something that those panels are attached to is called racking. There's a whole variety of racking systems. Uh, if you have an, uh, an ash, asphalt uh, sheet uh, shingle, uh, you'll see flashing most often used. Uh, if you have a metal roof or a flat roof, there's other possibilities as well. But uh, the nice thing is that if you talk with a solar installer to the installer will have a best sense of what is gonna be the best type of racking for you. You don't have to come in with that information. So you might be thinking or wondering, what if I can't put solar on my rooftop? Can I do ground mount? The answer is yes. And in some instances, ground mounted systems are better for you than rooftops. And we'll get we'll get to, uh, to some of those reasons in in a minute. Um, but the one downside for ground mount, you know, the, the upside is that there's a lot more flexibility in terms of where you put the solar and what direction it's faced, and if there's any obstacles or that type of thing. But the down the downside is that uh, ground mounts can be more expensive because of the cost of trenching, uh, digging a trench in order to bury the electrical lines uh, to connect to the inverter on your house. So what is a good location for solar? The best location is due south. But you can also get a good amount of solar resource uh, by facing uh, southeast, southwest, or even east or west. The worst uh, orientation for your roof is a north-facing orientation. Uh, you're really not going to get uh, nearly the percentage of a uh, solar resource by a north-facing panel as opposed to south or southeast, southwest. You also want some, uh, uh, an area with little or no shading. Um, that seems obvious. Uh, and whether that shading is from a tree or from another building uh, or whatever the case may be, but especially between uh, 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., that's when the maximum amount of time that uh, the sun 
shining on the panels and it produces the most intensity with the sunlight. Uh, you really want that uh, the, the panels uh, to be free of shade at that point in time. You also want enough space to mount the panels. Uh, you don't want to have in, any uh, dormers. Uh, you don't want to have any sort of setbacks that might restrict the number of panels uh, or vents or things like that. Uh, you'll typically need uh, at least 200 square feet of unobstructed roof space Again, that's facing a, a, per, a specific direction and has little or no shading in order to uh, mount a system that'll be large enough that the solar inst uh, installer will want to come out uh, and bid on your um, uh, your hope for proposal uh, so that they can uh, uh, you can purchase a system. And the last thing is uh, the age of the roof. If your roof has less than ten years of usable life. We recommend replacing it before going solar, and and actually uh, more and more solar installers will not even uh, talk with you about installing on your roof if it has less than ten years of usable life left. And let me just plug in here, just uh, uh, at near the beginning, we'll be talking about this later on. That one of the benefits of signing up for our Ready Set Solar program that I'll be talking about is that Solar United Neighbors includes a roof assessment uh, in that process of signing up for that program, and we'll let you know if your roof is a good fit for solar. And these are the criteria that we use uh, to judge that. Uh, these four uh, pieces as a primary uh, point of criteria. So we've talked about the panels, we've talked about the racking, we've talked about the placement. We're going to talk about the inverters a little bit. Uh, classically, the uh, the way that the original systems would work is that um, people would connect the panels to the uh, the string inverter. That's the number one. And the string inverters uh, are the brains of the system that collect the production in information and convert from DC to AC. They're uh, corrected to, or they're connected to a the whole array, depending on the size, or they're connected to one row of panels. But the inverters convert energy based on the lowest producing panel, which is one of the downsides of only using string inverters. And so that's where microinverters or uh, uh, the uh, optimizers that we see there in number two and number three provide a little bit of a balance so that each one of those are placed on a an individual panel. And so that way, if panel one is producing at peak capacity, but panel two for some reason is not, you still are able to get the maximum amount from the other panels if one of the panels is not working as well. So the next piece, how does my solar connect to my electrical panel? Most systems, especially if you have a newer home with a, new, a newer breaker box, uh, will uh, connect right into an existing panel. If you have an older home, you may need an electric system upgrade. You may need a dedicated box just for your solar array. But the solar installation companies will let you know up front if that is a need that you have for your particular uh, situation. So we talked about batteries a little bit ago. Uh, batteries are beginning to become something that is uh, more widely used as battery technology increases as well as the price decreases. And in here in Indiana with the end of net metering, which we'll talk about here in a few moments, uh, if you can afford a battery, a battery becomes more of an option because what the battery does is it not only helps you uh, when the power goes off, but the battery also stores your excess electricity so that you can draw on that electricity instead of sending it out onto the grid for the utilities to use. So the basic technology of the battery is simple. When the grid is down, the solar shuts off, but the batteries would keep that uh, the, your, your lights on in that instance. When might you want battery storage? If you have frequent utility outages, whether it's brownout or blackouts, if you have critical loads at home, and I really want to highlight this, if you if you have um, a farm business and you need to have a constant electricity for a well pump, or if you have medical equipment rather than uh, having, or in addition to a, uh, a natural gas or propane generator, you might also consider a battery because then you can use the electricity from the battery before uh, the uh, fossil fuel-based generator cuts on. And again, both of these also 
also connect with emergency or disaster preparedness. At this time, we're finding that batteries won't save you money and there is uh, not the incentive to help you get paid to send the electricity from the battery out onto the grid. But if you are interested in battery storage in the future, we really encourage you to get an inverter that is battery compatible. And this type of situation with the batteries and sending us out onto the grid is the kind of policy that we want solar advocates to speak up about so that Hoosiers can get fair value for the kind of value their storage can add to the grid. If you're interested, you can see here the uh, the link to uh, our battery storage for homeowners guide. It has a lot of informa more information than what I was able to share here. So we're going to have a Q&A at the end. And I know Fatima is answering questions in the Q&A and in the chat as well. But I wanted to also share a few frequently asked questions that we receive at Solar United Neighbors about a solar array system. So one question that's a very legitimate one is how long do systems last? And the answer is that solar panels from the 1970s, so over 50 years ago, are still producing power, but it reduced uh, efficiency and capacity. So they, they continue to last. And even though the panels are warranty, and I'll be talking about that in a minute for 25 years, it doesn't mean that after year 25, day one, the panels just stop working. They continue to work. And most the way it works is that most panels are warrantied to produce 80 or 85% of their original capacity after 25 years, uh, which is a, a pretty substantial amount of time uh, to, to continue to be expecting uh, such a high percentage of of uh, the panel capacity to be working. So there are several different types of warranties, uh, getting into that now. Uh, and there are warranties for uh, the system. And this is one place where you'll see some difference between installer quotes, because there will always or should always be uh, a warranty on the panels. There should also be a warranty on the inverters. Some will have some installers will have puncture warranties if uh, you have a type of racking that punctures into the roof. Uh, some will have uh, uh, like a maintenance type warranty or a, an, uh, an installation type warranty, often up to either six months or a year, sometimes more. Uh, and so there's a variety of different ones that you'll see across the board. And it's important to look at each of those warranties and understand how they're defined. So the one I mentioned was the power production warranty for the panels. That's 25 year warranty from the manufacturer for producing electricity at a certain capacity. And I mentioned that uh, here a moment ago. There's also product warranty for the panel. So that's uh, for defects re resulting from improper manufacture. And that's often for 10 years. Uh, the inverters, uh, have warranties. A string inverter's warranty will usually be in the 10-year range. Sometimes uh, some of them will be a little less, maybe seven years, sometimes a little bit more, depending on what the uh, inverter company is seeing. I would obviously say that probably a longer warranty would mean that a company is more confident that their product will last longer. And the main reason for that is that the inverter, as the brains of the operation, is the one that has the most electricity running through it and energy conversion happening all the time. And so that is the component that is the most likely to fail between the panels and the inverter. Um, the caveat to that is that if you got microinverters or if you got uh, power optimizers, uh, instead of the string inverter, uh, a lot of times those war warranties are up to 25 years. Uh, so you have a longer warranty for those. Uh, and then the other warranties, as I mentioned, you have a labor warranty, uh, you have other types of warranties that fall under uh, you know, puncture warranties and those types of things. Uh, and so you're able to, you know, when you uh, get a quote from an installer, and we often recommend getting quotes from more than one installer, you're able to look at each quote and uh, make a comparison. We also can help you with the comparison and helping you to understand making it apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. So the important thing is when you sign your contract, make sure you see all the warranties on your contract and who it who you need to contact if there's a part of your system that needs to be addressed. A lot of times people ask, what do I need to do about maintenance? Well, that's the beauty of solar. There's no moving parts. There's very low maintenance. You just sit there and watch it produce electricity. Uh, pitched roof uh, uh, solar arrays allow rain to mostly clean the panels, which is great. But every five years, we recommend an inspection and a wash as a best practice to make sure that you're getting a tip-top uh, production out of your array. 
A lot of times we'll hear questions about homeowner's insurance. And it's important to let your agent and your, or your uh, insurance company know that you're installing solar so that the array is covered. Uh, most For most people, your regular coverage will cover the, uh, the array. Sometimes there'll be a minor increase. Again, it depends on the coverage, and that may be a time to shop around for other homeowners insurance. Uh, if they're, if one is uh, wanting to increase your insurance and another says, no, we, we just add that on in as a rider without an additional cost. So um, additionally, some people times, uh, sometimes people will ask about your uh, home value or your property taxes. Uh, uh, nationally, studies show an increase in property values when people install solar. And in some ways, that's that's uh, intuitive in that uh, any time that you make any sort of a home improvement, uh, you'll see some increase in value, whether you're talking about making an addition or renovation uh, to a kitchen or bath or whatever. And so uh, adding solar to your home is making an investment in your home in the same way that you would uh, invest in your home in other ways. And so you're going to see, uh, uh, generally speaking, you're going to see your home value go up uh, if you install uh, solar. So, but what does that do to your property taxes? There is uh, an Indiana property tax exemption uh, if you install solar uh, and you gotta make sure that you file the paperwork and there's information on our website uh, at uh, solarunitedneighbors.org so that you can learn more about how to do that. Uh, but that is Indiana law that it uh, does not increase your property taxes. There is an exemption there. And finally, there uh, the last question that we get is, uh, will an Indiana HOA allow solar on my home? Uh, there's many HOA that encourage people to install solar, or uh, they're neutral, or they uh, have a reasonable policy. There are some uh, that are a little bit more difficult to work with. And if you are denied, there is now a clear path to overrule the HOA. It's not ideal, but there is a pathway to do it. Uh, there was a 2022 law that was passed uh, that allows for you or your installer, and a lot of times it's the installer, to go around to all of the members of the HOA and to get at least 65% of the HOA members to sign off. We've also heard heard stories that once the law is made known to an HOA board and it's no, made known that the board this refusal for people to go solar is the reason why P, uh, why uh, HOA members uh, are getting knocks on the door about signing a petition uh, to allow others to go solar that the HOA board backs down and they allow for a person to go solar then. Um, so there is information on our website about this as well. There's actually a whole page that's devoted to understanding this law and the process uh, of, of going, walking through it. And again, there are, other, there are other questions that you probably will have, but uh, we'll cover those uh, later on, or we'll uh, Fatima is covering them in the Q and A and in the chat. So here's uh, a solar milestones uh, slide here, and it kind of gives you a sense of the the timing and the process here. So uh, one month. You can see number one, the installer visits you and presents a proposal. And then uh, between one and two months, the installer designs uh, the system and gets the required permits. Um, and then uh, one to three days, the installer makes an appointment and comes to uh, your home and installs the system. And then in the next one to two months, uh, the uh, installed system uh, gets inspected. The installer gets approval from the utility to turn the system on. And then you turn on the system, uh, the installer teaches you about it, and you start saving money on your electricity and you celebrate. One key thing, make sure you look at number eight there. File your taxes and claim the 30% federal tax credit on form 5695, because that's a huge incentive uh, between now and 2020, uh, 2032, that's definitely gonna be there. So definitely make sure that you get the money back from the federal government for the federal tax incentive. And that's a good segue. We're going to talk a little bit about solar economics, and we're covering a wide range of uh, information here on this part. One thing that I think all of us know, whether or not we have solar, is that electricity bills keep increasing. And you can see here, we're trying to keep this graph as up to date as possible. It is inclusive of the most recent uh, INM settlement uh, amounts there, and you can see the average amount. 
uh, between now and uh, the next two, two or three years uh, for what the average bill is going to go up. And this is based off of uh, a household using 1,000 kilowatts uh, in a month, kilowatt hours in a month. The others are hypothetical. So Duke currently has a rate case. Centerpoint still has a rate case. Uh, neither of those have seen settlement yet. And you can see there the trend lines for uh, how much the average bill will be if either of or both of those uh, utilities get exactly what they're asking for. So uh, so it's important to keep an eye on, on this. And the fact that electricity bills keep increasing is actually actually rate incentive to go solar because then you're lowering your overall electricity use, which means that you're lowering your overall bill. Solar is a great investment. Costs have dropped nearly 75% since 2010. And you think about that, it's only 15, 14 years ago. Uh, it's no longer a specialty project. We see more and more people who are going solar for their homes or small businesses. And there's a strong return on investment so that once you reach that payback period, anything above that is money that's back in your po pocket. And again, I can't uh, emphasize enough the 30% federal tax credit uh, that steps down after 2032. That's a huge incentive for people to go solar. And here's a little bit more detail about that. This, uh, the federal government uh, renewed these incentives uh, in 2022 through the Inflation Reduction Act. And so we know that for the next 10 years or eight years now from between 2022 and 2032, that the federal tax credit will be 30%. And then there's a step down 2033 and 2034, unless the... Uh, the incentive is extended. One important uh, thing to know here is you do not need to have a tax liability to claim these tax credit. It's not uh, a type of tax credit where you have to have uh, some sort of tax liability that then spread out over multiple years. Um, you uh, you need to be, you can be able to get these tax credits uh, uh, without a tax liability. Sometimes people ask, how much does uh, an array, uh, a solar system cost in Indiana? And what's the payback time? Right now, we're seeing the cost anywhere between fifteen dollars and $30,000. Now, pricing depends on a lot. It depends on your goals. It depends on your energy needs. It's critical to discuss these with your uh, a potential installer or installers during the quote process so that you have a very clear sense of understanding what you're paying, how much, uh, how long it's going to take you to pay it, and you're going to, uh, uh, it's going to take before you reach that payback or break even time. Uh, the uh, break even, as I mentioned, is uh, off, sometimes called an ROI, return on investment, or your payback time. And when the amount of money saved on your electric bill without solar equals the amount of uh, that's paid for the system is how we determine that. The numbers aren't important. Uh, as important here is, is knowing how the systems are priced and where your break even time comes from. These prices represent full turnkey systems. And in this instance, they do not also include the 30% tax credit or any additional incentives that you might receive. So earlier I talked about net metering and, and now I'm gonna talk about net metering versus excess distributed uh, generation. And we're gonna go back to this uh, slide of the overall array in order to do that. So, Number five is the excess energy or electricity from your solar array that is sent out onto the grid and that the utility is obligated to purchase from you. It used to be under uh, Indiana state law that there was net metering, which was a one for one comparison where a kilowatt hour that you sent onto the grid was valued at the same on the market as a kilowatt hour that you received from the utility. It was a very simple understanding, a simple process. In 2017, there the uh, Indiana legislature uh, passed uh, Senate Enrolled Act 309. This method introduced a new scheme called Excess Distributed Generation, or EDG. Before EDG, we had net metering that I was just talking about a few moments ago. 
after EDG, we saw a very different scenario. EDG sets how solar energy you produce but don't use is valued. So it used to be the one for one. Now it is 25% above the wholesale rate, not the retail rate. This figure was not informed by any study or expert testimony on the value of solar. I actually happened to be in the Senate chambers testifying against the bill on the day that the bill's author was presenting it to the Senate Utilities Committee. And when he was asked how he came up with the number for the reimbursement for EDG, he just stepped back. He put his uh, hand on his face like this and said, well, you know, 25% just seemed like a fair number to me. That is one of the areas that we continue to fight back and try to fight back against. Indiana averages roughly around 14 cents per kilowatt for the retail price. That's the, again, the amount that we pay for power from the utility company. This year, the EDG average rate, the amount that you would receive for any excess is four cents per kilowatt hour. That's roughly between a quarter and a third of the value. Now rates can swing, each year it changes. So last year in 2023, the EDG value was closer to nine cents per kilowatt hour, or roughly about 60 to 65% of the retail amount. But this year it is drastically lower. And because of that, we feel at soil United Neighbors, that EDG is inherently unfair, unpredictable, and it really undervalues the true benefits of local solar on the grid. And that's why we, along with many of our partners in the state and other consumer advocates, challenged this law all the way to the Indiana Supreme Court. We lost that battle, but we continue to join solar owners and advocates to fight for our energy rights. So after all of this, you may be wondering, is going solar worth it under EDG? And the answer is yes. So under EDG rules, the solar you consume is the most valuable to you. And when I was talking about the battery storage earlier, that's part of the reason why batteries can be valuable as well, because you're using the electricity that you've produced and you're not sending it, you're not selling it to the utilities for a quarter of the cost that you're buying it from them. So part of what we really encourage for solar owners, uh, wherever you are on, uh, on the age of your array and how long you've had solar, to, uh, to look at uh, maximizing self-consumption. A lot of installers used to, under net metering, install system sizes that equated uh, and, and met 100% of what you were paying on your electric bill. Now, a lot of installers are looking at smaller system sizes that cover maybe anywhere between 40 and 60% of your electricity bill. And that, again, is to maximize the amount of, of savings that you see and minimize the amount of excess electricity that's sent out onto the grid. But when we're also talking about uh, self-consumption, we're talking about load shifting. We're talking about uh, looking at when we use the electricity that our panels are producing. And so uh, a big part of that, as you get this uh, chart, is to take the peaks of your energy use, which is represented in the blue, and shift it into the peak time of the solar production, which is represented in the orange. And so there are some different ways that you can do that. You can uh, maximize cooling your home during the high solar production times. You can uh, run the dishwasher or your electric clothes dryer during the day, during the high uh, solar production times. You can charge your EV if you have an EV during daylight hours. You can program home batteries to maximize solar self-consumption. So any any time that you can increase what you're using the electricity for during the, so, the, the peak production time, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about maximizing self-consumption. So if you don't have the upfront cash, the upfront capital, uh, uh, to pay for solar. Here are a few financing options. Uh, if you have a home equity line of credit, you can tap into that. You can take out a standard loan. 
Uh, you can uh, look at a bridge loan or a, a solar loan uh, through uh, the Community Development uh, Financial Institution or CDFI or the new uh, Indiana uh, Energy Independence Fund, a green bank that's coming soon. Uh, you can refinance your, old, your own mortgage and include a solar uh, array in the refinancing process. There are credit unions as well that uh, have some solar loans or some version of those. And you're welcome to go to the website that's listed there, solarunitedneighbors.org uh, forward slash financing to get a little bit more information. I wanna say just a couple of words about the Rural Energy for America program. Thus far, we've been talking about residential rooftop solar. There's also a program out there that helps farms and rural small businesses uh, to go solar with uh, some pretty substantial uh, 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 grant uh, stipulations. And so the USDA defines a rural small business as being located in an area with a population of less than 50,000. That's a lot of Indiana. Uh, Indiana Indiana only does REAP grants, even though it's a grant and load program. Re Indiana only does grants. They do not do the, uh, the uh, that office does not do the loan program. And there's a variety of reasons for that. And one other thing that I'll name here that's really important to know is that if you apply and you get a REAP grant, uh, uh, that can cover up to 50% of your solar array, then um, you also are eligible for the same 30% tax credit as residential households. And depending on your circumstances, you may also qualify for some additional incentives uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act. And so if you fall into the category of owning a small business and you happen to be in a part of the state that I've mentioned, or if you own a farm and you're producing 50% uh, or more of your gross income from agricultural operations, uh, I invite you to check out our website there at solunitedneighbors.org forward slash REAP, R-E-A-P. And now we're going to talk for just a couple minutes about our new program, Indiana Ready, Set, Solar. And we're really, really pleased about this program. So as some of you may know, we are, our bread and butter for Solar United Neighbors is our co-op program. And there's a lot of pluses for our co-op program. But one downside to it was that the co-op program used to be limited only in a geographic area, in a specific part of the state, and only for a limited time window with only a few programs per year. With Indiana Ready, Set, Solar, we open up the entire state and there's no time limit. You can sign up at any time. Uh, and we call this Indiana Ready, Set, Solar or RSS. And what you receive when you sign up, uh, and again, it's a free program. It simplifies the process of going solar and you get uh, an email uh, drip uh, uh, campaign over eight weeks of information, activities of learning uh, how to go solar. Uh, you get personal coaches uh, that help to navigate you through the entire process of going solar. And we offer unbiased installer neutral advice and expertise along the way. This program is tailored to the specifics of Indiana, including policies and, and the incentives, uh, some of which I talked about tonight. But you'll also get a network of support through a listserv of uh, peers across the state, including Sun staff, uh, solar homeowners and volunteers that can help you uh, with answering any questions that you might have. So this is a great program. Uh, we're really excited to launch. We've already seen uh, quite a number of people just in uh, the last week or two that we've had it open. Uh, a couple of dozen people have signed up already. And uh, so we're excited uh, to add you to the list uh, if you're interested in learning more. And I think one of the best parts that we didn't name uh, as explicitly is that our whole process uh, for introducing this Ready, Set, Solar program is to help you to make an informed decision. At the end of this campaign, you know, once you go through uh, these eight weeks of information, you're talking with the uh, personal coaches and others, if you decide after you get a couple of, of quotes from installers that it's just not the right time for you to go solar or there are obstacles for you going solar, uh, that's okay. Um, you know, we just want to create uh, uh, consumers and, and uh, Hoosiers who uh, are well informed about going solar and the whole process so that you can make an informed decision. So here's our website here, uh, solarunitedneighbors.org uh, and uh, with the forward slash uh, Indiana uh, Ready, Set, Solar, I-N-R-S-S.
We also have uh, volunteer opportunities with Sun, uh, and we have a number of people who come out and help us at our events. We're grateful for our, all of our volunteers. And if you want to learn more about how to volunteer, uh, you can uh, go to that website or you can scan the QR code with your phone while it's up there on the screen. And lastly, here before we go into the Q&A, just a couple of other actions that you can take to promote solar in Indiana. Uh, you can join the conversation our, on our public Facebook page uh, for Indiana. Uh, you can check us out there just uh, uh, when you get onto Facebook, search for uh, Indiana Solar United Neighbors. Uh, you can help promote our Ready, Set Solar program. And um, I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll with a question uh, about, uh, about uh, asking if you'd be willing to help with that. And if you want to do even more, we have a solar action team uh, that can help uh, uh, Hoosiers all across the state to fight for our energy rights. And one thing that we do for folks who sign up for our solar action team is that we include a sun team t-shirt that's like this one uh, that uh, you can be a part of our network and you can share uh, you can wear the t-shirt and uh, uh, people can see that you're part of our volunteer team and at this point I just want to say thank you for joining us for the webinar tonight and uh, just ask if there's any questions that uh, anyone has uh, that uh, to uh, lift up and, and bring from the chatter from the Q&A. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we have a very active chat and